Hey there everyone, AJ back again for the Mighty Gluestick channel. I make videos about Dungeons and Dragons lore full time thanks to your generous support, shares and views with multiple uploads every week to help share the rich history of monsters, locations and mythologies of D&D. Rangers! Time to take a look at the additional class options for the Ranger as promised. So today we are having a more detailed look at what goes into making the Gloom Stalker, the Horizon Walker and the Monster Slayer. Quite different from other Ranger types, the uh, Hunter and the Beastmaster. We'll also take a look at the Primeval Guardian archetype for just for the sake of completeness. Remember, they were unearthed, unearthed arcana articles representing playtest versions of these ranger archetypes. The Primeval Guardian was not one that carried through into Xanathar's Guide to Everything to join all the other additional class options. First up, what is different about the Monster Slayer compared to the Hunter? Well, I think a more accurate term for this class would be the Mage Bane, as they are specialists in taking down supernatural threats, including spellcasters. Another name for them could be Dragon Slayers. These master, uh, masters of the mystical arts are very focused on protection, investigation and banishment. I imagine a wizard who routinely summons and deals with otherworldly creatures would be wise to keep a personal task force of monster slayers with them in case things got out of control. These rangers would be excellent in exploration adventures, protection, um, protecting scholarly bards and scribes from particularly nasty, intelligent or exotic creatures. They may work as hunters for the most formidable magical beasts, uh, harvesting them for their re very rare, most expensive and sought after magical components or be specifically hired by regional powers to save townships and strategic borders or frontiers from threats the local fighters are simply unable or unwilling to deal with. For the first couple of levels, the rangers are all about where they come from and where they learn their trade. Xanathar's Guide has some random roll tables for determining the rangers' view of the world, particularly their outlook towards civilized people and their places uh, that they occupy. They're they, there will be some event in their past which has formed that core resolve and independence that has basically as the defining drive of the ranger. This may be tied into why they have a particular kind of enemy. They have the most um, experience in training and fighting. These favoured enemies may tie in with the kind of homeland that they come from. There's a random table for that as well, although the player is not obliged to to or obligated to roll on them. The list is quite thought-provoking as one ponders the combinations and possibilities. Why would an individual, a gnome say, have a particular skill in fighting undead, almost like a rite of passage, and coming from a desert environment, is this the makings of a monster slayer who breaks into ancient tombs and destroys the undead guardians? Well, being small helps fit into tight spaces and being clever or nimble is good for avoiding traps. There's a lot of money in tomb raiding after all, so maybe. This may be an entirely different to a furbolg raised by coastal pirates who haunt Sahawa hunt Sahawagan and sea serpents, spending their bounty on grog with their shipmates, sneering at the mossy forest elf. Skin is tanned as young Bark, who is selling narcotics to fund a supply of arrowheads as they need the cold iron tips to keep evil-hearted Fae from stealing away the elven children. Even though they all share the same skill set, they are vastly different characters to play, which is why background, outlook and focus is so important to the ranger class. Most slayers are protectors and they are killers. They quite often come to a sticky end at the hands of the most dangerous foes, so they tend to have a reputation. At third level, the hunt begins in earnest, and they learn to cast protection from good and evil. They also have a variation on the ranger's traditional divination ability, in that they can study an enemy within 60 feet and spend an action to discover if it has any resistances, vulnerabilities or immunities, and exactly what those are. Monster Slayers will learn to always be prepared with a variety of different types of of damages and their sources. They will have pockets of bags of salt, vials of acid, different poisons, bladders of oil, holy water, and carry an assortment of weapons, seeking to get an enchanted weapon as soon as possible if they don't have one already. They are jacks of all death dealing trades. Monster Slayers are the Boy Scouts and Girl Guides of death dealing, always expecting the unexpected. They also develop a fine understanding of the ecology of exotic creatures. As they say, the first step in avoiding a trap is knowing of its existence. Monster Slayers assess the foe before engaging with it. They always assume the situation is a trap, which is why they're still alive. Bonus points if you can name all the movies I'm quoting today down in the comment section. By the book, the ranger can use the hunter's sense a few times a day. I always ignore that limitation as it makes little sense to me that they steal away one of the Monster Slayer's most iconic traits. It seems to be a mechanic that exists for a game reason, not a realistic one. So yeah, I just ignore it and let them do it whenever they want. Slayers prey 
is the trait that makes more sense to limit, if you ask me. The Monster Slayer needs to be within 60 feet of a target. It doesn't have to be one of the one or two favoured enemies, but only applies to one enemy at a time. The first time the Ranger hits that target with a weapon attack, melee or ranged, the target takes an extra 1d6 damage. This benefit lasts until the Ranger finishes a short or long rest, but... The ranger can designate a different creature at any time, so the ranger deadliness is essentially always on. <laughs> Just no natural born killers. This is all in addition to the primeval awareness all rangers get at third level. Level 4 is all about either ability score improvements or selecting a feat. This is a hard choice, as 5th, 5th edition is based much more heavily on ability checks. The bonus proficiency, uh, proficiency bonus of plus 2 goes up to plus 3 next level, for those skills that the ranger is trained in, but improving an ability score by two points will give a general boost of plus one to all checks using that attribute. That's almost as good as being trained in a little bit in every skill associated with that attribute. If a couple of the attributes are just one point away from providing a plus one increase to their bonus, it is well worth splitting the increase across them both. Of course, feats are fantastic, and I always take a feat, but it's a personal choice and a case could be made for the best benefit benefits either way. Fifth level, the Monster Slayer gets a very interesting spell, Zone of Truth. Now, if you are on the trail of an intelligent foe, one that can manipulate and threaten people into withholding the truth of what they know, this spell is dynamite. Zone of Truth is an excellent spell. It has a 10-minute duration, a 15-foot sphere of effect. Anyone who enters and makes a charisma saving throw, or um, they cannot speak a lie. Also, if they make that saving throw, the ranger will know it. However, if the creature the ranger is hunting after uh, can wipe the memories of people, it gets a bit more tricky. By 6th level, the ranger gains an additional favoured enemy and an additional favoured terrain type. Normally this would be creatures that the ranger has been fighting frequently and a terrain type that they've been adventuring in. Actually, that brings up a question I have for you, and I genuinely, genuinely want to know your view on this. What sort of terrain type is a dungeon? And what sort of terrain type is a ruin above ground? Or an urban city dwelling or castle? How do you handle it when a player wants to get their bonus for underdark, underdark terrain if they're exploring a basement in a built-up city block? Does the inside of a gargantuan animal count as a cave complex? What do you reckon? Seventh level, the monster slayer gains supernatural defense. This applies to the target currently in the crosshairs of the ranger's slayer prey, slayer's prey effect. Whenever the target forces the ranger to make a saving throw, and whenever the ranger makes an ability check to escape that target's grapple, the player can add 1d6 to the roll, which is potentially better odds than rolling with advantage. Potentially. Eighth level, the slayer gets another ability score boost, or another feat, and the land stride ability. Level 9, they get magic circle as a bonus ranger spell, and a proficiency bonus is now plus 4 on skilled, uh, trained skills. Level 10 gives them the ability to hide in plain sight and their third favourite terrain type. And at 11th level, they get Magic User's Nemesis. This one is a doozy. Once per short or long rest, if the ranger can see a creature casting a spell or teleporting within 60 feet of them, they can use their reaction to try to counter that magical effect. The creature must succeed on a wisdom saving throw against the, spa the ranger's spell save DC, or its spell or teleport fails and is wasted. My advice is combine this with a full-on charge at the enemy and lay into them with a barrage of melee attacks as soon as possible to cut those feeble clothies to bits. But this works equally well against any monstrous spellcasters as well. This is a devastating ability. Basically, it's a counter, counter spell that they can use whenever they want. The Monster Slayer also learns Banishment and Hold Monster, and their final special trait, aside from their general ranger one, is called uh, Slayer's Counter. And this is, uh, they get this at level 15. The ranger gains the ability to counterattack when their prey tries to sabotage them. If the target of the slayer's, uh, ranger's slayer's prey ability forces them to make a saving throw, the ranger uses their reaction to make one melee attack against the quarry. They make this attack immediately before making the saving throw. If their attack hits, they automatically make the saving throw, in addition to the attack's normal effects, which is suitably potent for a high-level character trait. That's absolutely devastating. Horizon Walkers are a totally different kind of ranger. While they also specialize in dealing with exotic threats, they can take the fight beyond the natural world and stalk prey back to their dimension of origin. If your group is going to be spending any time traversing other planes of existence, this the ranger's a really good choice. 
in the high fantasy magic world of the multi ma magical worlds of the multiverse, Horizon Walkers keep watch over the planet portals and for close ties to networks and organizations of the multiverse. So they're a natural for factions and guilds uh, of the Ravnica or the the multiverse and single, as well as powerful planet creatures whose activities closely align with their go their own goals and beliefs. I know it says benevolent dragons, fey, and elementals and Xanathar's guide. But who says only good rangers can be horizon walkers? Not all heroes have the best of intentions. So they start with all the usual ranger features and at third level they learn an additional spell as a horizon walker which is protection from good and evil just like the monster slayer. But they also gain two abilities. One is detect portal and the other is planner warrior. Sounds impressive. Well, they, re they, they really are. The ranger gains the ability to magically sense the presence of a planet portal. They merely have to spend an action and can instantly tell the direction and distance to the closest planet portal within a full mile of their current location. They can do this once per short or long rest. Lots of things count as magical portals or planet portals. From spell magic to fairy circles, even uh, sort of naturally occurring planar crossover points such as the portals in the Shadowfell and the deepest, darkest places of the Underdark. This ability is extremely useful in planet, planar nexuses such as the City of Brass or Sigil. Next, as planar warriors, they can use a bonus action to choose one creature they can see within 30 feet and the next time the ranger hits that creature on the same turn with a weapon attack, all damage dealt by the attack becomes force damage and the creature takes an extra 1d8 force damage from the attack, which increases to 2d8 at level 11. You could say this is some sort of dimensional warping thump, like a gravity wave or something else equally impressive, because um, it's quite a handy ability. They gain the Misty Step. Um, they then develop that further into the, the class ability called Ethereal Step. Once per short or long rest as a bonus action, the Horizon Walker can cast the Etherealness spell without using up a spell slot, but the spell ends at the end of the current turn, so they just basically wink out of reality for a moment and pop back in somewhere else, having walked through a wall or popped into the border of the afterlife in order to punch a ghost in the face, for example. It also makes it very hard for creatures that rely on retreating into the ethereal plane to protect themselves from counterattacks from this ranger, and allows the ranger to completely avoid area attack damage as long as it sees it coming, and they have uh, they're ahead of it in the initiative order. So it sees a dragon about to breathe, pops into the ethereal plane, pops out back at the end of the uh, the round. They get haste. Uh, further adding to their mobility and combat effectiveness and, and their attacks. And then by level 11, they are seriously dangerous individuals with a class feature called Distance Strike. And the Horizon Walker regains the ability to pass between the planes in the blink of an eye. When they make an attack, and let's see, they get two attacks at level 5 plus one more from the Haste spell. They can teleport up to 10 feet before each attack to an unoccupied space that they can see. If they attack at least two different creatures with the action, they can make an additional attack with it against a third creature for a total of four attacks in one round. That, my friends, is a super ability. Anyone who recalls Nightcrawler infiltrating the White House and leaving a dagger in the desk of the Oval Office will know exactly what a ranger doing this looks like, except it's even quieter. No telltale bamf sounds and no little cloud of sulfurous smoke. Oh yes, they also get the banishment spell followed by teleportation circle at level 17. But at level 15, they gain the class ability to use a reaction during combat to simply phase out a little bit and give themselves resistance to all the damage, all damage from something that actually manages to hit them. I imagine they get nicknamed ghost or spooky or are you sure you are not a magical assassin? Quite a lot. <clears throat> The last from Xanathar's is the Emo Ranger, sorry, the Gloom Stalker, clearly designated more for the Underdark um, and designed that way, but they could uh, be quite at home in an elemental plane of Earth or the Shadowfell or in deep ancient forests with a very high dense canopy that blocks the light from reaching the ground, rainforests, that sort of thing, um, or sort of the fantasy forests that you see elven cities and things like that in where it's, it's generally dark all the time. They are a natural fit for the drow player character, or perhaps a gith on the hunt for a lithids. At third level, they have the ability to cast Disguise Self, and two class features, Dread Ambusher, gives the ranger a bonus on their initiative rolls equal to their wisdom modifier, and at the start of the first turn of each combat, their walking speed increases by 10 feet, which lasts until the end of that turn. 
if they take the action uh, attack action on that turn, they can make one extra additional uh, weapon attack as part of that action. And if that attack hits, the target takes an extra 1d8 damage of the weapon's damage type. This doesn't increase at level 11, but still, a second attack action at third level is pretty kick-ass. So this is a ranger is is more like a rogue, always aiming for a fast takedown attack, an assassin essentially. They also gain umbral sight, which gives them dark vision out to 60 feet, or increases their existing dark vision by an additional 30 feet. And they have the remarkable power of being permanently invisible to other creatures with dark vision, whenever they're in darkness themselves. This is one hell of an advantage for a low level character. I mean, even above ground, there's this thing called nighttime, and adventurers quite often take place, uh, do their activities in dark places. If you're considering considering being a character in the group with uh, a lot of characters with natural dark vision, this character class is a great pick. You can get that human bonus feat and see in the dark. Win win. You, your entire adventuring party can now walk around without any torches or lanterns. Fine. Uh, fifth level, they get the rope trick spell. Very handy utility spell, that one. You don't have to climb all the way into the extra dimensional space at the top of the 60 foot rope. You can use the second level transmuta- transmutation spell to just direct a rope up the side of a cliff or a tree um, and, or a cliff overhang and scuttle up it. And there's always ways to use a spell that thwart the dungeon master's plans. So be watchful or wary um, of those opportunities, depending on if you're playing or DMing. Level 7, and now hardened against Mind Flayers and the Fey with the Iron Mind class ability. They gain proficient, uh, proficiency in Wisdom saving throws, all Wisdom saving throws. If your character already has this proficiency, they instead gain the option of proficiency in either Intelligence or Charisma saving throws. So either way, they're going to come out of it a little bit harder. Level 9, they cast Fear, and at level 11, they get Stalker's Flurry, which are allows them to turn a missed weapon attack into another attempt with the uh, weapon attack once on each of their turns without expending any actions, any other actions. It just counts as the same attack action. This is probably intended to represent extra speed and agility with a weapon, a melee weapon, but nothing says it has to be uh, used with a, uh, it can't be used with a ranged weapon, as well as even that the second attack has to be against the same target. So you could miss with one and shoot somebody else entirely different. At level 13, they learn the Greater Invisibility spell. As if they were not hard to see before, now they can bring along a friend. They get this, uh, their last class ability, Shadow Dodge, at level 15, which allows them to dodge in unforeseen ways, with wisps of supernatural shadows surrounding them. So whenever a creature makes an attack roll against the Gloomstalker and doesn't have advantage on that roll, the Stalker can use their reaction for the round to impose disadvantage on that enemy's attack roll, but they have to declare and use this ability before the player knows the outcome of the attack roll. This is always a little bit tricky if, um, if you're not wary of players who take advantage of this. If you have a player that tries to make a habit of declaring this after they find out all the damage dice um, have come up with high numbers, well, you can nip that in the bud by saying no. <laughs> bad player and giving them a negative inspiration point or something which allows you to, to impose disadvantage on one of their roles of, um, of your choice at any time two can play at that game personally i don't need to do that i just stop talking and stare at the player until they reconsider the most recent thing they said or did i blame being subjected to the idea of the care bear stare in my impressionable youth i much prefer the gummy bears of course Final spell for the Gloom Stalker is Seeming, which is a cool spell if you're not familiar with it. It goes like this. This spell allows you to change the appearance of any number of creatures that you can see within range. You give each uh, target you choose a new illusionary appearance. An unwilling target can make a charisma saving throw. If it succeeds, it's unaffected by the spell. So you can basically illusionarily almost polymorph them. The spell disguises physical appearance as well as clothing, armor, weapons, and equipment. You can make each creature seem one foot shorter or taller and appear thin, fat, or in between. You can't change a target's body type, so you must choose a form that has the same basic arrangement of limbs. Otherwise, the extent of the illusion is up to you. The spell lasts for the duration, unless you use your action to dismiss it sooner. (laughs) <laughs> the changes wrought by the spell fail to hold up to physical inspection for example you, you can't use this to change a hat uh, to add a hat to someone's outfit the objects pass through the hat and anyone who touches it will feel nothing or would uh, feel the creature's head or hair the range of the spell is 30 feet so it's any creature within 30 feet and it lasts for a whopping 8 hours the uses of the spell well 
a smart player can do awful, awful things with this spell. For example, you can uh, polymorph, you basically illusionally change a whole bunch of innocent people to look like demons and uh, watch as they get butchered by everyone around them. Finally, the ranger archetype th that did not make it through to the uh, public playtest is the hippie ranger, otherwise known as the primeval guardians. Rangers of, of the primeval guardian conclave follow an ancient tradition rooted in powerful druidic magic. These rangers learn to become one with nature, allowing them to channel the aspects of various beasts and plants in order to overcome their foes. Less beasts, more plants in this particular case. These rangers dwell in the elder forests of the world. They venture out only rarely as they consider it their sacred duty to protect the druidic groves and ancient trees that saw the earliest days of the world. So they're reclusive tree-hugging hippies who pair up really well with a grove of elven vegan druid combat yoga masters, primeval elven timber archers or some such. They get a nice range of spells, actually, uh, starting with Entangle. Then at 5th level, they get the new Enhanced Ability spell, which is uh, formerly Eagle Splendor and Bear Strength and so on. Like the, uh, I like this combined version a lot more. It makes this a must-have spell for many of the my characters that can get it. Then at ninth level, they can conjure animals, and then giant insects, and then an insect plague. This class features all um, nature-oriented um, stuff, of course. Right from level 3, they start out with pretty weird with the ability to turn into a tree well the ranger can temporarily grow and take on the appearance of a tree-like person covered with leaves and bark so they're basically like a, um, a dryad or an ant type creature as a bonus action they can were a wear tree <laughs> as a bonus action they can assume this guardian form which lasts until they're either incapacitated or end it themselves as a bonus action they become large unless they're already large their speed becomes no more than 5 feet per round, unless otherwise enhanced. Their reach increases by 5 feet. They gain a number of temporary hit points equal to the levels that they have in the Ranger class. At the start of each of their turns, these, like all other temporary hit points, don't stack. So they are more like... Um, it's more like their plant body is just healing up some damage continuously. So they lose these points when they resume their normal form, but otherwise they've got this constant boosting um, temporary healing. Um, also, at third level, the ranger's command of primeval magic allows them to enhance their attacks with thorns. Once per turn, the ranger can turn, deal an additional 1d6 piercing damage to one creature they have hit with a weapon attack. This is a little weaker than the other ranger types, so if you want to increase that to 1d8 at, and increase to 2d8 at level 11, it's up to you. But I would allow that as it puts on more of an even footing with the other archetypes in the Xanathar's Guide, which have been adjusted a little bit. The player should certainly put that large size to good use and punish foes with that extra reach, perhaps combining it with what is already a reach weapon, such as a polearm. At 7th level, they gain impressive damage soaking ability, increasing the hit point maximum by 2 points per ranger level they have. And I keep emphasizing per ranger level, just in case you're cross-classing with some other level. Um, it's 2 points per ranger level, not your total class, um, class levels. They only get this benefit while in their tree form though, so feeling a bit like a one-trick pony in that regard. A tough pony but a slow and cumbersome pony. At 11th level, the primeval garden starts guardian, garden, how fitting, starts to get control of the land itself. While in tree form, the ground around them is twisted and turned and tore up to become difficult terrain for their enemies. Why it is not difficult for the allies as well um, is as good as your guess is as good as mine. You may want to describe this effect like roots and tendrils from the tree form tripping and snaring and snarling up the movement of enemies. It's up to you. Certainly outside of combat, I would allow the ranger to slip into tree form to give them a five foot burrowing speed through the ground, as long as it's not solid stone. At level 15, they start to radiate vital primal energy within 30 feet. An ally that starts their turn in that zone regains a number of hit points equal to half of the Guardian Ranger's class levels of Ranger. However, only if they have half or less of their total hit points. So it's not very useful against damage that reduces a character's hit point maximum on the rare occasions that that happens. Also, obviously, it's useless to any allies who happen to be undead or non-living constructs. But it still works on Warforge, though. I know Christmas has passed, but do please check out the merch on my Teespring store. There is a link in the description and should be one popping up at the end screen here.
It really encourages me to make more illustrations for you and help support the channel. If you have any ideas for new merch um, for the store, please let me know. I'm always happy to get feedback. If you're not subscribed already, it's well worth it as I have a 260 Monster Ecology videos, a number of player character class videos like this one for you to watch at your leisure. Please make sure to click on the notification bell and you should see regular uploads from me every week. I do this full time, so I upload quite a lot and can respond to any questions and requests that you may have in the comment section or any other means that you get in contact with me. I'm quite approachable. Those who wish to explore the links in the description text under the video, you will see links to my Patreon page where you can get access to all of the scripts for these videos, which have all the names and locations and references collected in them, as well as having special access to some patron exclusive content, a slowly growing list of vids that do not appear in the general public. You can also join the Mighty Glue Stick Discord server, a great place to chat, create your own game groups, run video games uh, with people around the world, share dank memes and discuss all things D&D. Link down below as well as a link to Patron Blades. Um, the Patron Blades, I highly recommend Patron Blades. They've uh, been using them for quite a few months now and really enjoy the quality and convenience. No more crappy, rusty, blunt, big shavers and angry face rash for me. As always, thanks for listening everyone. I'll be back with more for you very soon.